Serial killer Levi Belfield is behind bars for the brutal killing of three women. But it's now claimed he's confessed to another murder 21 years ago. He said, I've never told anyone this before. I killed another child and got away with it. It's alleged he admitted to killing the Russell family from North Wales. Michael! The revelation questions the conviction of Michael Stone. He spent 20 years in jail. In my view, the conviction's unsafe. Tonight, we investigate if Levi Belfield could have been responsible for one of the most notorious crimes in Britain. An idyllic setting. But 21 years ago, this tranquility was shattered. The bodies of a 40-year-old woman and her daughter were found on farmland on the outskirts of Chillenden near Dover. The Russell family from North Wales, Lynn, Megan and Josie, were savagely attacked by a man with a hammer. Nine-year-old Josie was left for dead at this isolated spot in the Kent countryside on the 9th of July, 1996. She'd been walking along this country lane with her mum, Lynn, and six-year-old sister, Megan. They were going home just on the other side of this copse. Michael Stone was convicted of the murders, but he's always protested his innocence. Now, notorious serial killer Levi Belfield has allegedly confessed to another prisoner, saying it was him that attacked the Russell family. He said, I've never told anyone this before. I killed another child and got away with it. The police were never even close. The fellow prisoner, himself convicted of serious offences, says Belfield confessed to him in a series of conversations earlier this year. He wishes to remain anonymous, and his words have been revoiced. Levi Belfield was vocal and excited, and told me how free it made him feel by being able to tell me a secret he'd kept for 20 years. Belfield and the other prisoner are said to have had several conversations. Belfield's alleged to have gone into graphic detail and even drawn a map of the murder scene. What gives this alleged confession even more credibility is that, as far as we can tell, it contains certain details that would have been known to only a very few people, like police investigators or the killer himself. The alleged confession was prompted by a TV documentary broadcast in the summer about the attacks on the Russells. He said in the minutes leading up to the programme, he was physically uncontrollably shaking, and, and he put it down to being anxious about watching the programme. In the alleged confession, Belfield says he attacked the Russell family as they walked home from a swimming gala. Lynn and Megan were bludgeoned to death by their attacker. The family dog was also killed. That was quite heavy. Josie was assumed to be dead, but she was found to have a faint pulse. Despite suffering horrific injuries, Josie survived. Within months of the attack, Josie and her father, Sean, had moved from Kent back to the Nantle Valley in North Wales. They've always been led to believe that Michael Stone carried out the horrific attack on the 9th of July, 1996. My main emotion is one of relief, that it's all over at last, and that the, the verdict is what I consider a good one. But Stone's legal team say Levi Belfield's alleged confession calls into question that verdict. We have in detail, at length, uh, exactly what Belfield did 
at the time that he was doing the murders in relation to the Russells. Barrister Mark MacDonald represents Stone, and he believes that Belfield's alleged confession is credible and significant. This is not, let me sit down and tell you a story. This, this is just a number of discussions that took place over a number of days with drawings. He supports the, um, the narrative, the confession, if I can put it that way, with, um, with and, and, and let me tell you where I was, with an X marks the spot, and this is what I did. So, again, it all goes to the, to the credibility of, of, of the confession. In the alleged confession, Belfield goes into detail of how he attacked the Russell family. On the day of the Russell's murders, he said he'd simply noticed them walking by chance, so stopped. He said he approached them with his hammer in hand and the mother screamed and begged not to hurt her children. He struck her first and then Josie. The dog was killed, followed by Megan. He, he said he'd pulverised Josie and he was surprised she'd lived. I, I said if I was him, I'd have been a bit more careful saying it was risky being so close to the road entrance as, as anyone passing would see. He reassured me he attacked them far enough up the lane that it couldn't have been seen by the road. The attack on the Russells appears to have some similarities with other crimes Belfield has been convicted of. He murdered two women, Ameline de Lagrange and Marsha MacDonald, after striking them from behind with a hammer. He was also convicted of the notorious killing of schoolgirl Millie Dowler. Colin Sutton led the murder inquiry, which helped to convict Belfield, and saw him jailed for two whole life sentences. I was investigating the death of Emily Delacrange, and the more we looked at him and what was known about him, the more he became a likely suspect, and, you know, it, it sort of went from there. Does the retired detective think that Levi Belfield could be capable of the attack on the Russells? The similarities you've got are, are a, a woman uh, in a quiet location, a blitz attack with something heavy and blunt like a hammer, for no apparent reason, no previous interaction between them as far as we know. And that in itself, you know, just those features make it an extremely rare crime. And because of that, there is the natural tendency to look at, well, who else do we know who's committed crimes that have got these very rare features and very rare MO? And, of course, you end up looking at Belfield. In the absence of other facts, he would be a good suspect. Levi Belfield and Michael Stone are in the same prison in Durham, and Belfield told us that Stone has made several attempts to get him to admit to the attack on the Russells. Stone denies this. In his alleged confession, Levi Belfield admits he began offending as far back as the 1980s. The attack on the Russells took place in 1996, and some of those closest to Belfield at the time had already become increasingly suspicious about him. This picture of me on my horse and Levi was taken at the Yatey Horse Show in Hampshire. And what's the significance of that? That's, Levi said he'd never been to that area, and obviously the picture puts him there, but that's where Millie Dowler's body was found. Joanna Collings was Belfield's girlfriend in the mid-90s, living with her in a parent's house in south-west London. She'd become increasingly worried about Belfield's behaviour. Well, I found a magazine once in a bin liner in the garage and it was, you know, like a vogue cosmopolitan kind of thing and all the pictures of dark-haired girls, nothing. All the blondes, he'd stabbed, the, like, the faces, slashed them. Did you ever challenge him about why? Oh, yeah, you? no, I did because my dad's donkey jacket was in there and he'd cut the inside of the pocket out and there was a balaclava and a big, like, carving knife. And when I found it and I pulled him on it, oh, he went mad. And what was he using this... this balaclava on his donkey jacket. He used to go down the alleyway behind where we lived in Strawberry Hill. 
Once you get in by the station, you couldn't get out. And that was one of his hunting grounds. He used to go and wait for people down, like, to see if he could get someone down there. But this was when, then? End of 96, winter time. Do you believe that he was responsible for, for other murders? Yes, I do. Fully, fully believe he definitely killed more. Joanna's concerns about Belfield's behaviour emerged in 1996, the same year that the Russells were murdered. There's no doubt Belfield had a violent past, but what about Michael Stone? One of the reasons Kent police suspected him of killing the Russells was his previous convictions. He'd been found guilty of a hammer attack in 1983 and sentenced to four years. I wanted to ask him about his violent past and he agreed to speak to me from jail. You've got a, um, a track record of, of, of violence. You, you hit a man with a hammer. You've got... Uh, uh, yeah, but it's just desperate to, to, to link me to the crime, but it's not even similar because... I went to the house of someone who I found out was like messing about with people, you know, you know, and threatening him not to do it. And he grabbed my throat and I picked a mallet, it wasn't an hammer, it was a mallet, to strike him with it, to get him off my neck. It's nothing like attacking a child or, or a mother and a child. And just five days before the attack on the Russells, Stone made threats to kill his former probation officer and the officer's family. It doesn't matter with what people think of me. It's not about whether I'm good or bad. Anything else what they say about me is irrelevant to the basic question of who was there on the day murdering those people. As well as the alleged confession, a new eyewitness has come forward and actually identified Levi Belfield near to the murder scene, driving a Ford car similar to the one described by other witnesses. The new witness, who doesn't want to be identified, says she was driving between 4.15 and 10 to 5 on the day the Russells were attacked, July the 9th, 1996. Her attention was drawn to a car which failed to slow down at this junction. The car accelerated harshly with the tyres screeching and I heard the crunch of the gears as the gear change was made. A month later, she gave a statement to police in which she said the car was a Ford Sierra or Escort. She says it was driven by a man with slightly tanned skin, an oval face and aged between 35 and 50. But what struck her was what the man was wearing on that summer's day. He was wearing a brown blouse and jacket with a stand-up collar, it was chunky. He sat tall in his seat. The top of his head was obscured by the driver's sun visor. It seemed strange to me that he was wearing a jacket, done up. And it was such a warm and muggy day. After reporting this to police in the summer of 1996, the eyewitness thought little more of it until she saw a documentary about the murder of Millie Dowler last year. And then she was able to identify the man she'd seen 20 years earlier driving erratically. A picture came up on the screen and it shocked me, stunned me. It was exactly the same collar, the high-collared coat that I described to the police on the day of my statement. It was a photograph of Levi Belfield. There were other witnesses on the day of the murder, but the evidence of a man seen acting suspiciously are inconsistent. Indeed, some reported seeing two or even three people in the area. With the investigation stalling, police turned to Crime Watch for help. A little later, a local resident had to slow down as a car pulled out in front of her. It was coming from the direction of the murder scene. That witness who followed the car helped police put together an e-fit of the man she saw driving away from the murder scene. The same e-fit helped police to identify Stone as a suspect for the first time. Josie confirmed the EFIT was a good likeness of the man who attacked her, but she didn't pick Michael Stone out at an ID parade. Neither did the eyewitness responsible for the EFIT, but she did say he looks very familiar. Well, this 
the first time I saw this was when the police brought it here soon after Mick was arrested. Detectives took the ephit to Stone's sister to see if she felt it resembled her brother. And they held them up and they were trying to explain to me the similarities. So the police were trying to persuade you that these two pictures look the same? Yeah, that, it, that Mick could be that person. <laughs> look at the furrows along there, nothing there. The hairline in particular. The hairline. And also this person's got quite a wide face, whereas my brother's chin, I think, is quite prominent. Mm -hmm. So these two pictures are a Belfield. Again, the hair shape is looking very slimmer, the shape, the face is about the same, the ears are the same. Do you think that Levi Belfield is possibly the killer? Do you think that the evidence against him is certainly stronger than against your brother? I mean, I won't be drawn really on did he do it or didn't he do it. I'm just saying there is definitely more evidence against him than there ever ever been against my brother. Despite extensive tests, police were unable to identify the Russell's killer from forensic evidence. In the alleged confession, it's claimed that Belfield said he wore gloves during the attack, but he was worried about developments in DNA testing. The alleged confession has been revoiced. He, he was very concerned at the advances of DNA um, and how any development might point to him. It was like saying, my life in jail will be over if they can prove it was me. Alan Jameson is a forensics expert and he's familiar with the evidence found at the murder scene. Given the ferocity, the brutal nature of the attack on the Russells, would you have expected the killer, whoever he was, to have left behind significant amounts of DNA and other evidence at the scene? Well, it depends on, on what the killer was thinking. I mean, it may be that they've actually deliberately taken precautions to avoid leaving evidence. Uh, I mean, many people are forensically aware, um, and so, for example, they take precautions not to leave fingerprints by wearing gloves, for example, and perhaps this is one of those cases where the evidence, certainly at the time, was undetectable. <laughs> There was no forensic evidence linking Michael Stone to the scene. No DNA, a fingerprint found on a packed lunchbox was not his, and hairs found on a child's shoe have not been identified. A key piece of evidence for detectives investigating the attack on the Russells was a car seen on the day of the murders. Several witnesses reported seeing a beige car, possibly a Ford, in the vicinity on the afternoon of July the 9th. Michael Stone was questioned by detectives about the cars he was driving in the summer of 96. What kind of car were you driving at the time? I had a Toyota Tercel 2 door, but I wasn't at driving it because I had I made a bit of a deal with somebody who was going to fix my car if I let him drive it around for a few days. Four days before the murders, Stone had been seen by a police officer driving the white Toyota. And a week after the attack, Stone was stopped by another officer and was driving the same car then. But what about Levi Belfield? Did he have access to a beige car at the time? The prisoner to whom he allegedly confessed says he did. He was driving his girlfriend's car. I, th I think he said a Ford Sierra. Um, not red, though, but beige. But after the murders, it was burnt out and, and she'd claimed on the insurance. One of the cars that was associated with Belfield was a, a beige-coloured Ford Sierra Sapphire. Was that in the...? I had a Sapphire, yeah. He had gone out one night in it to Bedfont, to the working men's club that he used to go to quite a lot. Um, conveniently, it got stolen and it was found burnt out. And do you know when this was? What year? What month? It was in 96. It would have probably been the end of March somewhere around that time. The Russells were attacked in the summer of 1996. In a statement to this programme, Levi Belfield denied using his former girlfriend's car on the day of the attack. In the alleged confession, Belfield says that straight after attacking the Russells, he went to Turkey. 
It's claimed that pattern of disappearing in the immediate aftermath of a crime is something he repeated years later. Geoffrey Wansell is a journalist who studied Levi Belfield and written a book about him. He would take the family away on holiday immediately after committing a crime. Oh, we'll go to Tenerife. We'll go at once. We must go tomorrow. He would remove himself from any suspicion of evidence against him. He was immensely cunning. He would cover his tracks, sell the car, give it away, hide it. Belfield's confirmed to us that he did travel to Turkey in 1996, but he denies fleeing there after the Russells were attacked. But one key question remains. Why would he be in rural Kent, 100 miles away from his known haunts in London? Did he have any connections in Kent? I mean... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's got connections. I think there's something to do with a mobile home or, like, a, a holiday home sort of thing. And he was back with some falls to Kent quite a bit. Do you know whereabouts in Kent? No, not off the top of my head. Michael Stone did have connections to Kent. He was living in Gillingham at the time, about 40 miles from the murder scene. Well, I know all of Kent, really, don't I? But when I went with the jury in the bus and visited that area, I have no recollection of the place whatsoever. So that's well off my beaten track. Another reason Kent police suspected Stone was his lack of an alibi. At the time, he was a heroin addict, and he couldn't give a satisfactory explanation for his whereabouts on July the 9th, 1996. While Belfield's girlfriend had concerns about his behaviour in 1996, she insists he couldn't have been responsible for the Russells' murders on July the 9th. My daughter was born in 96, and that was the day of my birthday. He never left my side all day and all night. So there's absolutely no way he could have got from Twickenham, where I lived, or Windsor, where I kept my horses, to Kent, done what he, they say he did, and got back without me not knowing he was there. So you, you don't think he was responsible? I can handle my heart. I hate to say it, but I can say handle my heart, he didn't do it. On the face of it, Belfield appears to have a solid alibi. So does that weaken Michael Stone's case? In my view, there are question marks about her alibi uh, as to whether or not she is mistaken. That is for others to decide, not for me. I don't know. But it's not black or white. It's not black or white. Levi Belfield has been convicted of three murders, and in his confession, he allegedly details many more crimes he's committed. It's claimed he showed the prisoner he'd befriended a list of offences going back to the 1990s. There were 96 entries listed, ranging from attempted indecent assault to murder and every possible sex offence in between. He, he said he had accomplices on several of the attacks. Um, and after showing me the list, I, I advised him like, it wasn't a good idea to keep a list like that. He said he'd been questioned on about 30 of them only. But I said he should tear the list up. Belfield denies any such list exists. The detective who investigated Belfield is in no doubt there are many more crimes he was responsible for. I'm sure that we've, we've only scratched the surface. The, you know, the crimes for which he's been convicted probably uh, represent a very small percentage of what he's done throughout his life. But his criminality knew no bounds, in my view, and, and I think, you know, he, he, he's probably committed hundreds, if not thousands, of, of offences over the years. A few hundred yards down the road from where Belfield bludgeoned Ameline de Lagrange to death in 2004, Edel Harbison had been attacked just four months earlier. Why were the police convinced that, that, that the man who attacked you that night, that nearly killed you, was Belfield? They're convinced he murdered Amelie de la Grange. And when you look at the cases, they're almost identical. They're, they're frighteningly identical. So the entire location is the same. Same time of night, same neighbourhood. Obviously, I was a lot older than her, but we looked bizarrely alike. We had similar clothes. I had a red de la jacket, she had a red jacket. I think when you, when you look at the crimes side by side, they're just mirror images of each other. 
Edel suffered serious head injuries in the attack, which it's believed was carried out by a man with a claw hammer. But police were unable to charge Belfield with attacking Edel because of a lack of evidence. I didn't need to see my name on the charge sheet to, to get the confidence that the right person has been convicted. Belfield denies carrying out the attack on Edel Harbison in 2004. There is another unanswered question about the horrific murder of the Russells. Why would anyone carry out such a brutal attack on a woman and her two children? What was the motive? Despite his denials, Michael Stone was found guilty of the attack, and at his trial, the prosecution suggested his motive was robbery, to feed his drug habit. Josie recalled the man who attacked her had demanded money. Although Geoffrey Wansell isn't convinced that Belfield killed the Russells, he believes he was certainly capable of it. If he's not killing for money, he's not killing for revenge, he's not killing for sex, none of the classic motives, he's killing because he can get away with it. And he has got away with it. And he likes getting away with it. And it makes his ego even larger. That's what makes the killing machine that is Levi Belfield. In a statement, Levi Belfield told this program he did not kill the Russells, and he denies having confessed to their murders. After his trial in 1998, Michael Stone successfully appealed, and the convictions were quashed. But after a retrial, he was found guilty for a second time. We asked Kent police to respond to the new allegations. They told us that Michael Stone's protests of innocence have been thoroughly tested by the judicial system. The main evidence remaining against Michael Stone is, ironically, a confession heard by this man, Damien Daly. In 1997, he was in a neighbouring cell to Stone, and Daly says that Stone confessed to him via a pipe in the adjoining cell. Michael Stone's confession has always been controversial even though two juries accepted its credibility and found him guilty of murder. Stone and his supporters have always said it cannot be relied upon. But Michael Stone is himself now pinning his own hopes of a fresh appeal on another alleged confession said to have been made here at Franklin Prison in Durham. Why should we believe this confession any more than the alleged false confession which you said was made by Michael Stone? Knowing something in a confession that other people would not know goes to the core of the credibility of the confession. But it goes further because of the way that he takes the confession, the way that he writes it down, the fact that he is telling his, his solicitor the day that he hears it, I have just heard this. So he's supporting it at the same time as he's writing it by telling someone what he has heard. It's corroborative. So we have a confession, we have parts of the confession that's not in the public domain, and we've got an eyewitness to say, it was Belfield I saw there that day. In my view, the conviction's unsafe. But again, it's up to the Court of Appeal, has to be tested, has to be scrutinised. Michael! Michael Stone has applied to the Criminal Cases Review Commission again in the hope of returning to the Court of Appeal once more. But it all hinges on the credibility of the alleged confession by this man, Levi Belfield. <laughs>